Another flat earther has been trying to play scientist. Mr. Thrive and Survive has spent some time trying to gather evidence for the idea that moonlight cools things down. What he is trying to do is to measure temperature using a thermometer which is placed in the moonlight and comparing the readings to one which is placed in the moon shade. I think that he is being honest in the sense that he is genuinely trying to investigate this. The key word is trying. Unfortunately, he doesn't really have the skill set to perform the experiment or analyze the results. Mr. Thrive and Survive claims that the results support his hypothesis. Now, spoiler alert, this is incorrect. I will go through his experiment and pick it apart a bit. I will then follow with an exploration of what a positive result would actually mean for our understanding of physics. So we begin with the setup. In the experiment, two thermometers were mounted on either side of a board. The board is then positioned such that one side faces the moon. The temperatures are then measured periodically to check which side is warmer. Then, using an infrared thermometer, the temperature of the displays is also checked for a second measurement. Another test is to place two sensors in identical plastic boxes and covering one with a piece of paper so that it is in a moonshade. The results are interesting. Uh, with the thermometers mounted on the board, we see the side that faces the moon consistently yielding a slightly different measurement. How different exactly? Well, the average difference is 0.72 Fahrenheit with an uncertainty of 1.12. As zero is within one standard deviation of the nominal value, there is no significant difference as far as this experiment can tell. Now, the tests using a laser thermometer showed something interesting. Only two measurements were taken, and the average difference between the measurements was 0.05 Fahrenheit, with an uncertainty of 0.2. Again, not a great result for the cold light hypothesis. The boxes did show a significant difference, though. There were three measurements with an average difference of 2.1 and an uncertainty of 0.4. But let's consider where this difference comes from. Perhaps it is that piece of A4 sized white material which happens to be a pretty decent thermal insulator. Now this is all based on some pretty sparse measurements and considering the mean and the standard deviations in this way is not particularly useful. Even if the results were significant, the number of measurements performed would still not be sufficient to draw any conclusions. But for the best that we can tell, the experiment doesn't show anything. But let's explore the experiment a bit more, as there were some pretty big failings. Firstly, the board will shield one side from the wind and not the other. Mr. Thrive and Survive commented that there was very little wind, but there will always be some. Secondly, you notice that the temperature jumps up due to their body heat when someone comes near. This is expected, but they consistently spent more time performing the measurements on the dark side. Towards the end, they tilted the board such that one side of the board faced the moon directly. The difference did increase, however, whilst tilting, they were consistently close to the dark side of the board and their own measurements and commentary shows that their body heat messes the results up. In addition, Mr. Thrive and Survive stated in an earlier video that the board is a good thermal insulator. Okay, what you're looking at here is uh, this piece of insulation that I have right here. I guess it's one inch thick, uh, or at the very least three quarters inch thick uh, insulation that people will put in their walls and things like that. So it's much better than cardboard itself. I still may mount cardboard over top of this on both sides and then the thermometer on top, but it's not going to be necessary. This itself uh, won't even allow, the, if you have it out in the sun, won't even allow the sunlight uh, heat to come through it. So this is excellent. Uh, conductor or I should say block blocker of uh, temperature proceeding through. There are a few other issues but I'd rather explore a better method. I would suggest that you just take two identical thermometers next to each other and place them on a flat surface in the moonlight. You then position an obstruction to cast a shadow over one of the thermometers. Make sure that you position this such that it is far enough from the thermometer so no one can say that the object is insulating in some way. Or ideally, you can place the object so that it is equidistant to both thermometers. You use a data logger which records the temperatures at regular short intervals without human interference. 
You subtract one of the data sets from the other. You take the average of the differences in the standard deviation. If the average is greater than the standard deviation, then you would have a significant result. But let's imagine that we do have a significant result. What would that actually mean? First, we must explore how light is emitted. Let's consider an electron in an atom, and the electron is in a ground state. The energy of this state is E0. Now, there is another energy state above that, but for the electron to populate that energy state, it needs to have energy E1. Now, let's say that a photon hits this electron, and this photon carries just enough energy to get the electron from E0 to E1. The electron is now in an excited state. But there is an energy level E0, which is now empty, and nature doesn't like things having more energy than what is necessary. So this excited electron quickly goes back to the E0 state. But to do that, it must lose energy. And the energy is lost by emitting a photon, which has the exact same amount of energy as the energy difference between E0 and E1. So the energy of the photon, which is the product of the wave's frequency and Planck's constant, is also equal to the difference between E1 and E0. This photon can travel through space and hit another object to put that in a higher energy state. Now, if the photon's energy is right, it can excite an electron in another atom. Alternatively, it can make the whole atom move faster. The latter corresponds to an increase in temperature. Its increase in energy is equal to the energy of the photon, so E final is equal to E initial plus the photon's energy. Now this is where it gets weird. The whole idea of cold moonlight is that the moon is actually a light source itself, and the light it emits actually cools things down. So a photon emitted by the moon takes energy away from whatever it hits. This means that E final must be less than E initial, and as a result, H nu must be negative. Now, H is definitely not a negative number, and therefore the frequency nu must be negative. But if we go back to the emission of light, if light is emitted due to an electron moving from E1 to E0, and the photon has a negative energy, then that would mean that the energy state E1 is a lower energy state. This implies that the energy of an electron would decrease as it gets farther from the nucleus. The result is that electrons cannot be bound to a nucleus, and therefore atoms cannot exist. Fortunately, atoms do exist. If you want proof, here's a picture of some atoms. So we clearly need to invoke magic to keep all of this together, and I'm doing this so we can look at some more ridiculous results. The energy of a photon is given by the product of Planck's constant and the frequency. The momentum is given by the energy over the speed of light. But given that the frequency is negative, the magnitude of the momentum vector is also negative. Now, this is very silly for a great many number of reasons. Ignoring the fact that a vector cannot have a negative magnitude, a negative frequency could mean that if light had negative energy, then it would not travel from source to target, but rather from target to source. That is to say that if there were some emission event resulting in the release of cold light photons, then the photon would travel from the atom that it cools down back to the emitting atom to be emitted. Now, given that light travels at a finite speed, it means that the whole atom would have to be cooled down by the cold light photon before the cold light photon is emitted by the atom on the moon. Alternatively, you could take a positive energy solution where the earthbound atom is in a higher energy state and it emits a photon with positive energy. And the photon then travels back in time to the moon where it is absorbed by an electron. If all of this makes no sense, then that would be because it is all nonsense. I have been scratching my head on this for a while and it would be fun to see what you guys can come up with for this particular problem. What can we expect if the moon really emitted cold light? 
post your thoughts in the comments section and let's see what we can come up with. Now this peer review is a bit shorter than the previous ones I've done and this is because Mr. Thrive and Survive actually performed an experiment which is very good by flat earth standards just by virtue of taking measurements. And this is probably why so many of the less honest flat earthers don't really bother with measuring things, because by recording the measurements and making them public, Mr. Thrive and Survive made his results transparent and falsifiable. But that was it for me on this one, so I would like to take a moment to thank my patrons who are Thomas Miller, Walter Bislin, Johnny Ragadu, Kevin Deadman, Stringer News One, MC Toon, Stan Zaystaff, Cy Blacklock Hughes, Michelle Randall, Ugly German Truths, Mick Simmons, Kai Broking, and Steelman. And thank you all for watching. Until next time.